how did the your how do your perception of what you think your parents felt about you shape your entry into manhood hmm. and I got this from your conversation about you and your father <laughs> And I don't know if you want to expound on that first, but I thought it was a very heavy thing that I would not have suspected coming from you. Well, so, like, honestly, like, I I grew up without a father. Um, well, so all my life, basically, before I even get to that part, like, all my life, I grew up with uh, my my sister and my friends. Uh, we, everybody in my in my neighborhood had their father figure in their life. My sister had her father figure in her life or whatever. I was the only one out of all the group of my friends who did not have a father in their life. Um, so it kind of like tormented me. Like I remember crying myself to sleep uh, many a times. And I remember my sister's father took me with them. Like he was taking, his, he was taking my sister out somewhere or whatever. And I kind of felt like at that point in time, it was more like on the petty side. Like I mean, like just kind of like to like make me feel good, whatever. Yeah, because I cause yeah, felt bad. Yeah. That cruise, yeah. Um, Moving forward in life, um, about 22, 22 years old, I moved to Atlanta. Uh, I just, I was in the military, moved to Atlanta, and I wound up finding my father. Um, literally, this man lived one exit away from me, which is about like seven minutes away wow. in Atlanta, ironically. I found a man, long story short, the minute I asked him why he left, he, like, he, he began to tell like, um, I'm the father, you're the son. Like, who are you to question me? That was his stance on it. <laughs> and so we wound up, we wound up, <laughs> we wound up uh, at 22, like I was a little high head at the time, or whatever. So we wound up exchanging words at that point in time. Like, I didn't curse him out or anything like that, but I kind of felt like, who are you to, to say something like this when I'm the one who found you? You didn't come finding me, right. anything like that. Um, about a couple of years after that, like, we had stopped talking. And I decided to reach back out to this man. And we wound up getting into it again. And his words to me was, you was a mistake, I never wanted you. Yeah. And it kind of like messed my whole like world of thinking up. Yeah. So I kind of felt like the way I grew up, like I grew up without a, a, a I guess a, a male figure in the household mm -hmm. because I kind of rejected everybody that was, uh, that was coming into my mother's life. Right. Like one of the one of the guys that was involved in my mother's life at the time, whatever. I felt like he he abused me. Uh, he used to beat me. He was a weight, uh, a body, like, black body builder. Yeah, body builder. Yeah. Okay. And uh, he used to like he had like the the raw high leather uh, mm -hmm. weight belt. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. And uh, he used to like beat me with that, or like he'll pick me up by my shirt straight up off mm -hmm. you know, off the ground, and like he'll like just throw me, and. That left like a, a bad scar. Like, so I, I really didn't want to deal with any of my mother's uh, male figures or whatever that they came into the household. So I, I kind of like really just like stepped back from everybody that she introduced me to. And it was it wasn't as many, but it was all of them I did not like. Uh, and it was a problem for me. So 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 how did that rejection? And well, I mean rejection from your father. And this was, of course this did this didn't happen at twenty two. This happened all throughout your life. The rejection and the abuse from other men shape your idea of who you were. Like, how did that affect your esteem, your self worth, your your sense of value? So, like, when it comes to uh, like my self esteem, my self worthy, I kind of felt like I didn't, I wasn't wanted. My, I, I used to tell my mother like when when it happened, um, I told my mother and I told my grandmother uh, that I kind of felt like a bastard because. Essentially, that's what a bastard is. Yeah. Whatever, like, that's a shameful thing for people who feel yeah, that way. Yeah. But yeah. that's how I felt. Yeah. Um, we had uh, we had conversations, and my, my, my grandmother used to always try to uh, tell me, "Oh, that's not what it was," or whatever. But her telling me that, and with him with him yeah. telling me, is two different it's things. It's quite like, different yeah. from like, right. If the source told you, it would be another story. Exactly. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. So like, it, it kind of weighed on me. I was like, I always had this complex where I'm like, damn, like, how can your parent tell you that they didn't want, want you? you. Like yeah, you was a yeah, mistake yeah. or whatever. So listen, it it weighed it weighed hard on me. Listen, um, I had a parent tell me, you know, as I said earlier, I had a parent tell someone else to come pick up their child. Yeah. Yeah. I'm yours. Where yeah. the hell do you want me to go? Yeah. And um, I can speak for me, and, and I don't know if anyone can relate to this. And I know that you were in the welfare system yeah. too. Um, <laughs> I I used to lie about my family. 
when people would ask me, mm-hmm. I would lie about my dad because I didn't because ex- I I so much didn't like how being in their family made me feel. Mm-hmm. I made them up. I literally mm-hmm. was a pathological liar to save my self-image. Mm-hmm. Either I had no parents or my parents were the best. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I was ashamed to say that my parents didn't want me. Yeah. I was ashamed mm-hmm. to say that they didn't know how to act. Um, I became a pathological liar out of a need to, to save my story and to not feel ashamed of my family. Uh, and it hurt me a lot. So going into adulthood, my image of being a man, like I said, I didn't know what that was. I just wanted to survive until the next day. And survival will have you doing things that, if you look back, you're like, thank God I'm alive. Yeah, yeah. You know, and not just about surviving and eating. It's about being in relationships that, as long as you can get in and out by the skin of your teeth, you consider it successful. Yeah. So your level of success is totally altered. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what you consider success is different than a person who has, who has been reared to think high of themselves, to expect sort of the best, to think about education and think about a five-year, ten-year plan. I had a, a one-week plan. If I can get through Sunday, then we're going to talk about Monday on Sunday. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. One of the things that I realized that I, I, I guess that I have is uh, <laughs> abandonment issues. I, I recently, I just started um, going to see a, a therapist. Mm-hmm. Um, amazing. Amazing. Yeah. And I realized that uh, my need for, I guess, not so much as an attention, but like for the the nurture of, I guess, another male figure like mm-hmm. that I've missed out on, like right. growing up, like I have a need for it. Well, I had a need. I don't know. I don't know what it is. I'm still going through the process right I, now. I, I, yeah. I can't relate. And so honestly, it, it's 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 bothersome. Honestly, there's like, a hole there. There's a hole. There. It so, is. I, I, you know, and and it shows up in your relationships. Uh, it does. Whether you whether you're gay or straight. Abandonment issues will have you second guessing every action in that relationship. Then as soon as you have an argument, oh damn, maybe I say too much, maybe and so maybe they'll walk away. Or or self-destruct, meaning I know you're gonna leave anyway, so let me just do the just absolute do whatever work. I want to do. Exactly. And I expect the loss. I, I yeah. listen, I, I do that so <laughs> and I realize I'm starting to realize yeah. that I do that so much. Um, and then, like, I'm also like creating dialogue where the dialogue is not supposed to be there. Absolutely. Like, I'm doing certain things mm-hmm. in life, especially with, with, when it comes to like other members of my family mm-hmm. or whatever. Like, I'm creating so many things based off the need for one thing that I've mm-hmm. never got. And I thought, I, I honestly, I told myself that I was over the situation. Mm-hmm. I, I wrote about it. I, I, and then, like, this man still doesn't want nothing to do with me. And one of the things that kind of like that kind of like threw me off was when um I was uh I was on Facebook one day, and this is before he blocked me because he blocked me. Wow. Mm. Uh, I was on Facebook one day, and he uh we had an, I had another sister that he has never um I guess seen at this point in time, and when I met him, my story with him was a little different from the way he met when he met my sister. When he met my sister, he put on a little Facebook, my long lost daughter, I'm so happy, wow. blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that's, that's and I'm looking at it like, dang, like, yeah. I didn't get yeah. this. This is not the welcome party that I got. Yeah. Like, when yeah. I when I came to you, it was like, he lied to me straight up the rip. Like, well, you bringing up so many questions I got on this page. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, so when I found him, I actually talked to him, and he told me that, um, he was like, oh, I'm not in contact with none of your brothers and sisters. Like mm-hmm. they, they're in jail or they're this, that, and the third. Mm-hmm. Maybe like a half an hour later, his niece called me and she was like, um, I just want to let you know, basically long story short, your dad was lying. Here's a number to your brother and sister. I didn't get my number. I didn't get my brothers and sisters' numbers from him. Mm-hmm. I got it from my, my mm-hmm. cousin. And she was like, this is their numbers, blah, blah, blah. You go ahead and reach out to them. And I reached out to them and it was like, that threw up so many questions. Like, I'm just now meeting you and walking into the conversation with you lying to me for no reason. I don't know you, you don't know me, right. whatever. And I'm 22 years old right. Right. and you telling me a lie. So like, that was our relationship. It just, walking in the door was just a whole lie. So I, I just have so many mixed emotions when it comes to this but let's man. Think, but let's think about something because I know that at least three of you, because I know you personally, are pretty much well-mannered, well-educated people. Isn't it amazing that no, no amount of education, no amount of success in your personal life will ever fix unhealed abandonment? Exactly. Yeah. And no, no, it doesn't. And the thing is, is that a lot of times, even with me, my abandonment issues is different. Like, you mm-hmm. know, um, my father was murdered. I was with my mom for a little while, and then she couldn't take care of us. 
So when I got into the foster care system, I already had the knowledge of my dad is gone, my mom can't do it. So I have to make it work wherever I'm at. Uh -huh. That carried me on to my relationships. So in my relationships, it's like, you know, you have, we have to make this work, we have to figure this out, we have to go to counsel, we have to do these things, blah, blah, blah. Even when the relationship is dead, even yeah. when the relationship is abusive, even when the relationship <laughs> is no good. You know, I was in a bad marriage for a pretty long time or whatever. And, you know, you know, I don't want to talk negative right. about her, but it's just she wasn't ready and everything was bad. So, you know, I had to get to the point where my pastor had to teach me you can't chase running people. You have yeah. to let people go. You have to Seriously. cut people off because it becomes survival. Yeah. You know, it becomes survival. So when you realize those things and you you do it to heal yourself, then that's that's a long process to do because your whole life you hold on to everything right. yeah. because you have nothing. And even being in foster homes, you know, they they I was blessed to be in and I always say Christian households. I didn't move around a lot, but every household wasn't perfect. Right. So you had stuff that was going on that you'd be like, oh, for real? Right. Well, when they come and ask these questions, I'm going, oh, everything's fine. But every kid, <laughs> every kid would say how horrible it is and they would get to me and say, well, what's going on? Nothing. It's great. Yeah, it's 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 work. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I don't, because the other thing is too, those kids wanted to go back with their parents. I don't have anywhere to go. Right. So, nah, bro, this works for me. This right, is, this right. is gonna, I'm going to make this work until, you know, it's done or whatever. And...